On this episode of the YouTube channel, it is a podcast, actually. Uh, this is my episode that I filmed with Kelly Meyer of How Not to Start a Damn Brewery. If you haven't listened to the podcast and you are interested in the beer industry, I highly recommend. I've been listening to it since it started, uh, but Kelly and I also have some history. He was a brewery owner here in the state of Texas, specifically in New Braunfels, uh, and so I've known him throughout the years in, in the Texas craft brewery scene. But he started coming into Tanglefoot once I opened, really enjoyed the style of beer that I was producing, so we kind of reconnected in the latter part of the history of Tanglefoot, and ultimately he asked me to be on the pod when I decided to close the brewery down. So this is a longer one. Uh, this is the more unedited uh, raw audio and video that I took from that day. Feel free to go and listen to the podcast on Spotify or wherever else you consume podcasts, but I wanted to put this on the channel as well with a little bit of video uh, added to it. So Without further ado, this is a longer one, so thank you for your attention if you're going to listen to this, and uh, let me know what you think. Cheers. <clears throat> well, Andy, I want to be thank you it's from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to let me in your space today. This is uh, the first in-person interview I've done in years, so that in itself makes it entertaining and fun and unique, um, more so the fact that this is the interview that I never wanted to have. So <laughs> I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to do with my first interview that I don't want to do. Awesome. I'm um, happy to oblige. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyways, welcome to the show, man. Thank um, you. Super sorry that the, the business closed, um, but let's spend some time today going through it. Let's find out kind of what happened. But sounds good. Before we get there, tell me, Yeah, I, I've known you since you started this. I think I had met you before in the industry before, but um, before the industry, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Who, who were you to begin with? Yeah, I had a pretty clear idea of what I thought I wanted to be when I was like 14 years old. I went, I wanted to be a, a pastry chef because I had this like specifically pastry. specifically pastry okay. chef. My mom took me to this resort in Florida. I met this pastry chef. I had my, you know interest in food my entire life uh, growing up around this family that cooks like crazy. Uh, and so then met this pastry chef in Florida and kind of decided for whatever reason, I was just like steadfast. I'm going to be a pastry chef. And so the next four years of high school was like, that was my identity. It was like, I'm going to be a pastry chef. We ended up taking a, a tour down to Austin to check out some culinary schools, ended up going to one of those culinary schools. So I left, finished high school and then went immediately to culinary school for pastry, graduated there and then went to work in the industry and quickly realized that the restaurant industry was not where I wanted to be. Um, I worked in some hotels as well. And uh, were you able to take just a pastry chef job right out of the gate? So just well, like put other shit and then also make pastries on side. I had a pastry. So the, the, the program I was in uh, was basically a nine month in class pastry program. And then like a three month externship is what they called it. So I went to Florida for my externship or internship that placed me um, like I got the job, I had to go and get the job myself. But basically I worked at a hotel and did exclusively pastry stuff right mm -hmm. out of the gate. So we're pretty fortunate in that regard. And then left there, ended up moving to Arizona, uh, Scottsdale specifically, and on a whim, my buddy was moving out there and, or he had, was living out there. And I went out there on a whim. He was like, come move. And I said, like, oh, all right, whatever. So I flew out there and then applied for a few jobs and got a job at this nice little uh, French bistro restaurant as a pastry cook and loved it for the first like six months. It was awesome. So was a pastry cook there, learned a bunch of stuff and then got like my, um, my first recipe on the menu. So that was super cool. But in that six month period, I was 20 at the time, uh, I got into beer. Mm. So I had, that was, that's kind of dovetails into my beer story where I in Scottsdale. So the specific. restaurant was in Phoenix, but yeah. Uh, some, some beer that changed it for you? There's some, you remember? The, so I worked at this restaurant and at the time it was 2010. So I was 20 years old and I had a coworker who homebrewed and he had brought in some homebrew and I was like, oh, that's interesting. You can make your own beer. Uh, I was too young to buy beer. So that sounded yeah. appealing to me. And then we also did some beer pairing dinners um, at the restaurant with uh, like a brewery like Santan Brewing out mm -hmm. there. And uh, Chandler, I think it is, but at Four Peaks also. So we did a couple of beer dinners out there, and that kind of piqued my interest. Then I turned 21 while I was living in Arizona and just went kind of ape shit and <laughs> drank every beer I could get my hand on. Uh, and out there, it is a literal, like, beer um, oasis in the desert where it's, like, a great selection from California, from Colorado, mm -hmm. had some stuff from the Northeast. So it was kind of this, like, really, really great beer selection, got exposed to all that, and then... Decided I wanted to be in the beer scene um, or around a cool beer scene. So I moved to Austin after that, and, or moved back to Austin. Okay. 
And did you go straight into beer or did you have to get like a culinary job first? Yeah, yeah. I went, so the, the first job I had uh, back in Austin was running a food truck, a Belgian waffle food truck, and then did that <laughs> for a few months. That actually seems very fitting for some reason. I can't figure out why. But yeah. I could picture you. <laughs> well, I was drinking all the Belgian beers at the time. So I had, I had some, uh, yeah. some interesting, uh, actually that job, I don't tell this part of the story often because it's kind of like a three month blip in my story, but that job in particular was the first exposure to the Austin craft beer scene unintentionally. So I was running this this food truck downtown and we would, you know, just open downtown five days out of the week or something. And, but then the money was always in offsite events. Uh, mm-hmm. And so we would go to like, uh, you know, house parties or things like that and festivals. But then we went to, the first thing we did was we went to Jester King. They called us out there, went to Jester King and was like, I love these beers. I love these people. I actually met Jeff Steppings there and was like, hey, man, I made this like special dessert with your beer. He was stoked about it. And then we did some Austin beer festival. I don't think it was the Craft Brewers Festival in Austin, but it was some some festival. And I actually met some folks from Edelbert's and like we're drinking beers and stuff. So that was like early exposure in the Austin craft beer scene. And then worked at another restaurant gig, whatever was a horrible job was kind of like the nail in the coffin of like, I don't want to be in this industry anymore. And, uh, and then because, because the hours were long and there was like not that much pay. Is that what's uh, so that part of it? That you- so, so the, the next job after the, the, the Belgian waffle spot was a, an, a, just a regular ass restaurant, a shitty restaurant. Mm-hmm. And I was a server. It was my first job as a server. And I did that for a few months and I made like no tips. It was awful. And I drove like 30 minutes to get there. And then they had an opening in the kitchen as just like the line cook. And I was like, whatever, dude, I'll get a steady paycheck at $10 an hour or whatever. So I did that. And it's just working on a, working on a hotline is it for me, the most stressful thing I've ever done. It turned me into a huge asshole. I hated my life. I did not want to go into the, to the restaurant every day. And so at that point I was like, yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. During that time of working at that other restaurant, I started going to Black Star and Black Star Co-ops, a group up in Austin, for those that don't know. And I uh, kind of fell in love with that place. And then when I decided I couldn't, I couldn't stay working at that restaurant anymore. So I, I was just drinking at Black Star after work. And one of my buddies that I met there was like, yeah, we have an opening on the pub team. You should apply. I think you'd be a great fit here. And I was at this weird point where I loved homebrewing. So I was I was actively homebrewing at the time. I loved drinking craft beer, but I all of the kind of like these interviews and, and these uh, kind of tales from the beer industry were always like, don't get into the beer industry, which is hilarious that I'm here like 12 years later uh, on this podcast. Well, we all but heard that. I know. Okay. We, I mean, but that was the sentiment and the sentiment that I want to, I want to put out there for anybody that's listening to this, that is interested in getting in the beer industry is you hear often like, Oh, it's all clean. It's 90% cleaning and it's only 10% fun stuff. And that was like a big barrier for me to get into it. Cause I was like, man, that sounds awful. And then I fast forward a little bit in the story. When I did get in the industry, it's just part of the job. It wasn't even that big of, it was like, yeah, yeah you clean. Like you, if you cook food at home, you do the dishes. It's not that big of a deal. So there was a lot of like negativity around that, that I didn't, I thought was kind of like not, um, I don't know. It, it, it didn't seem like it was very helpful for the industry. So I, I don't have that perspective. I think if you want to get into the beer industry, the physical work is not the biggest deterrent. There are other factors, but, um, as long as you can find air conditioning space, which is sure. Do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, that a few times. Yeah. So I, uh, yeah. So anyways, I got a job at black star front of house and then there was an opening in the brewery got into the brewery and uh, started doing, you know, just part-time keg washing and, and cleaning floors and stuff. And then worked my way up as the head brewers left. I took over there, became the head brewer at Black Star Co-op in 2015. And then, yeah, I worked there for several more years, ran that place and then uh, started Tanglefoot in 2021. Okay. So quick question along those lines, like there's every brewer kind of has their own pedigree history and even theology about whether it's important, but whether you're self-taught experience on site or you actually go to a Siebel or a UC Davis or whatever, uh, did you consider going to one of these schools now that you've been there? Oops, let, let me, let me add a little cover of that. You made some of the most challenging beer to make and you made it well. So to back up, how the fuck did you figure out how to make beer? Well, that's a good question. Uh, thank you. First of all, second of all, I had a mentor at Black Star. So Jeff Young was the mm-hmm. head brewer at Black Star, one of the original founders of Black Star. Is he still there when you went there? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He so he was I don't know how long you were there, but okay. Yeah, so he ended up leaving in like twenty fourteen. But anyways, he so he kinda took me under his wing and taught me everything he knew about technical brewing. And he had a, a like a, a chemistry and science background, mm-hmm. so he was very analytical. And I have like half of me is very analytical and like science oriented, and then half of me is like very artistic and like, you know, not uh structured. But uh so he kinda taught me everything about uh the brewing process there. At Black Star, he also had a bunch of materials where he actually went to brewing school. So but there was mm. a catalog of videos and some textbooks and things like that that I referenced. So I did kind of practical hands-on training and then some more like theoretical, like there's like, a, I think it's called just the science of brewing. Mm-hmm. The textbook, it's like super thick, but very dense, like uh, scientific information about, about the brewing process. So read all that stuff. And then, but really the hands-on experience is what kind of showed me how to brew beer, at least in the the way that he was taught. And so that helped a lot. And then during that time in the Austin grad beer scene, and it's still this way, like the, the, one of the highlights of the beer community is that there's so much camaraderie and there's so much sharing of knowledge and information that it was just nonstop 24 seven learning stuff. Like I, you would go to a, a pint night somewhere with friends at other breweries and you just learn about tips and tricks and different styles that people were brewing. So that was helpful. And just being, yeah, just being immersed in it. I didn't have like I had didn't have a family. I didn't have a girlfriend. I was just me, a single dude, just like immersed in this. Heaven, brain, right? yeah, yeah, exactly in this beer experience. So, but all hands on practical uh, training. I didn't. I didn't go to school. Okay. Yeah. So before you started the brewery, you worked there as a brew pub. You guys made consistently just you had some core styles, but obviously yeah. all kinds of shit. Were there favorite beers that you made at Black Star? Yeah, I mean, there's a few. My fir- the very first beer recipe that I made and brewed at Black Star was one of my favorites, which is, I mean, whatever, just luck, I guess. But it was a pale ale called Numa. So just like a West Coast style pale ale up to that point, I wasn't, we weren't brewing West Coast style, I or like hoppy beers. So they were generally more malt forward or like more of a malt presence, less dry. Um, and so I really wanted to take something that was like drier, bitter and just like really piney citrusy forward. And so that was one of my favorite beers. And then I also did a collaboration with a buddy in, um, uh, in the Netherlands and we brewed this beer called Rose Sap, which translates to uh, pink juice, but basically it's like a guava sour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was another beer that I really liked, but we did a bunch of stuff there. Just, yeah, I think we had like four beers on consistently that were staples and then everything else was rotating. So did you go based straight from Black Star to here? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so I started this while I was still working there. Did you do like some beers there and then not, or you, no. you were building it? So I was building the brand. So the, I guess if we want to get into that, yeah, now the Tanglefoot story. Um, I started Tanglefoot because of an opportunity that I had. So this, um, for those that don't know, um, this brewery was opened in my family's barbecue restaurant. So they uh, owned this barbecue restaurant in Simple, Texas for 54 years. They, My dad was running it at the time and it was kind of going through the transitional phase where they were trying to make some changes and like grow and stuff. And I, we had just like jokingly mentioned, hey, why don't we, it'd be funny if we put a brewery in there. <laughs> and this was like a year before I actually seriously considered it. And then uh, did some research, found out it was actually illegal for them to even have a beer license in this location. And the next month, the city of Temple changed the uh ordinance to allow alcohol permits to be um, allowed in this area of town. And so that was in, I think that was in like 2020, 2019. And so they applied for a permit to sell beer and wine. And then once that happened, I did a little bit more digging into it and was like, oh, in order to become a brew pub, you just check a box and pay a fee and you submit the documentation to TCB and CABC and you're a brew pub. Um, So I was like, it's, that's the simplest, easiest and lowest cost way to start a brewery. That's my, I, cause I didn't want to start a brewery after working in yeah. the industry for so long. I was like, I don't want, I'm, I don't have the money. I don't feel comfortable taking on investment for this business model that I don't see as a very profitable opportunity. And, uh, so I was, I didn't really have the intention of starting a brewery until this became an opportunity. So once we kind of, t- uh, talked about it potentially happening, said that we would go ahead and give it a shot. And then I was immediately like, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to do something that I'm like actually passionate about because I know it's going to be a grind. I know it's going to be a lot of work. And so Temple, Texas is in a county called Bell County. And there's a lot of Czech uh, settlement here, Czech immigrants that settled here in the late 1800s. My family is uh, part of that lineage, um, or I have some of that 
uh, heritage in my family. So I was Czech. There was Czech community here. And I was like in love with lager at the time. Still am. But I was like, I just want to brew lager. And there's a huge Czech community here. So let's try to brew these traditional styles and serve this community and see if it works. And so I went full force into that as far as the brand and the beers and all that stuff. And then just kind of went down the rabbit hole of, uh, yeah, Czech lager. So what was your inspiration for lager? What were you drinking when you were like, hey, I need to make more of this? Because in my opinion, Austin does not have a huge lager scene even today. And Live Oaks, hands down, one of my favorites. Yeah, but I'm not sure who I'd even put a second place. Now you're close. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again. Uh, but yeah, so my the longer lager story was I went to, um, I went to Bomberg, Germany in 2017. And then that was my first, that was my first time in Europe. And it was my first experience with like, real European water at the source. And it's, it sounds so cliche, but it was like mind blowing. I was like, I, I remember specifically having this Keller beer at, I think it was Brewery Especial in Bomberg and was just like, this is incredible. It's balanced, it's delicate, but it's still full flavored and drinkable and like all these things. Um, and so came back to the States and then just started brewing water at, at Black Star and started trialing things, did some like Keller beer tappings. I had a wooden barrel and a brass tap and did some of that stuff. So that was the inspiration behind like really falling in love with lager. And then outside of that experience, the natural, kind of the natural, what I call the craft beer bell curve of flavor is like you start off with a pale ale or some entry level beer and then you just explode into triple dry hopped IPAs and bar bourbon barrel aged raspberry stouts. And so you just get palate fatigue. So I was at the point in my career where I was kind of getting pa uh, palate fatigue and alcohol fatigue where I was like, I don't want to drink six, seven, eight percent beers all the time. I want to drink like four or five percent beer. So naturally lean more towards lager. And then, um, yeah, I kind of decided on the Czech thing before I had ever really been exposed to Czech lager, um, which is kind of a, a weird thing. But I had really only had Pilsner Raquel before I started uh, this concept. Yeah. And so in the process of me looking into different recipes and looking into like traditional brewing methods uh, and it started to homebrew these things, I just started falling in love with, with the beer. But then I, I started also falling in love with like the beer culture because the Czech beer culture is just, it's incredible. Like the service of the beer, the environment is generally like homey and, and warm and, and it's all about like talking and, and having relationships and stuff so i fell in love with that and then yeah started brewing more of the beer so that was the plan like what in the beginning tanglefoot was meant to be something different in that regard where it was some more of a european take on the beer and the beer culture yeah so the the i ended up getting more and more kind of like i or um uh pigeonholed i mean it was intentional it was a czech water brewery but pigeonholed as this like czech place but it was less about the actual like Czech heritage part of it and more about the, yeah, it was more about the, the European beer culture, which in my opinion, the best example of that is in the Czech Republic. Like the sitting down at, it could be a really nice hotel. It could be a really shady bar in some back alley in Prague, but every place serves a beer in a branded glass with, uh, that's per per poured perfectly with the right amount of foam with a branded coaster. And it's just like the whole experience is like, Excellent, I think, in my opinion. So, and the beers are great, and they're balanced and drinkable, and you can know nothing about beer and enjoy it, and you can know everything about beer and nerd out. So, yeah, kind of, kind of, all over the place. You can it, it attracts what I thought would be like the largest amount of people, but okay. So, I'm sure we're gonna get into towards the end why Temple was or was not the right place to do it. You had an opportunity to building; it made sense. That I think that there's a lot of reasons why you should do that, but. Let's talk about the model itself in the beginning. So you came from the brew pub mm -hmm. and you decided you were going to open here primarily to you know, have that influence of the, the, the Czechoslovakian or Czech Republic way of doing it. Um, so this on-site presence, was there a distribution in the plan? As with a three and a half barrel system, I'm assuming not really, at least not in the beginning. Well, when I opened, I was brewing, uh, I mean, I was mashing in 15 gallon uh, mashes. Yeah. So, or, so I double mashed into a one barrel kettle. So when I first opened, it was straight up. It was a homebrew. There was no option for, there, there was no way it would have made money on any, any situation uh, on a one barrel scale. But uh, again, it was to kind of like launch the brand and get off the ground. But then after a year uh, in business, that's when I scaled up to the three and a half barrel system. And right before, actually it was probably about six months after I opened, some, somewhere earlier in the timeline of Tanglefoot. But I went from, I really wanted to build this, 
kind of unique beer experience where like somebody comes in here and exclusively gets the beer from my, from me poured on these taps into these glasses in we're sitting in the beer salon, uh, yeah. which is the original bar at Tanglefoot Brewing. Uh, and I wanted this environment plus the beer to be the experience. I wanted it to be this like unique thing that you couldn't get anywhere else. Cause frankly you couldn't cause it was so specific and like unique. Um, but after about six months of being in business, I was like, oh, these beers, like, even though I'm not crazy busy, these beers resonate with people. Like, people are asking for beer to go. People want this beer to take with them to share with their family in Nebraska or something. And so I quickly was like, oh, this could be really, like, this could be Temple's beer. I, I just had it in my mind. Like, this could be Temple's lager. I want this to be a part of the plan. It's like, scale up, distribute, get it, get beer onto the shelves, which is not uncommon. You said that, in the beer said that out too. That was your plan initially, right? To burn it. At that point, was to be Temple's beer. Yeah, that was the goal. Yeah. yeah. And it should have been, again, towards <laughs> the end why it wasn't. But um, so in the beginning, it was primarily service here. Uh, what were you doing to bring people in? How were you marketing? What was the... I did the opposite of what you should do if you want to open any business, really, or specifically a brewery. Uh, I opened this concept without, I mean, I, I had an Instagram page was, was basically it. I, I had Instagram, I had followers on Instagram from primarily from like the Austin beer scene, but then some folks in Temple, they kind of caught on. Um, and then I opened this particular bar with no signage out front. The building was still red from the barbecue. There was no, nothing other than looking at Google maps saying that there was a brewery here mm -hmm. that would have told you that there was a brewery here. So I opened in the dumbest way possible, but not, be, that's not unique, unfortunately, but yeah, that, maybe not, but uh, kind of this embarrassingly. Uh, so my thought was I'm going to run out of beer so quick. I was really nervous about like selling out of all my beer the first weekend or like the first couple of weeks. And I brew these Czech lagers, which take like two months to make. So I was like, oh man, I'm just going to open up and sell out all my beer. And then I'm going to be screwed and have to close down for a few weeks. So that was honestly my biggest concern. Fast forward, that did not take place that wasn't you know that close to what issue. happened yeah. uh so i i had my 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 perspective was skewed from the beginning but yeah i didn't do much outside of um instagram and facebook and then i started the youtube channel in i think 2022 and that was you know the goal was to document the growth of the small brewery and kind of like my whole story and do some beer education stuff um, like a professional brewer's perspective on kind of like a smaller scale, something that would be approachable to home brewers. You can call it brewing check loggers in a tiny brewery or something like that. That was like the first big yeah. video that took off. Yeah. And then, uh, so yeah, just documenting that. And that started in 2022, but outside of that, not really anything ran a couple of Facebook ads, but, uh, after, after being in business, as long as I ended up being in business, uh, three years, I, I, I knew all of the things that I wasn't doing well, and I knew what I thought were the solutions to those problems. I just didn't do it out of like pride. And because I didn't want to, I didn't want to sacrifice the things that I, because I built this whole brand on passion. I wanted this thing to exist and it was very selfish, um, but I thought it would also resonate with other people and it ended up, that was the case. But uh, so I didn't want to sacrifice all the stuff that I put into it to, build this passion project and then say, Hey, I'm like, in order for this passion project to exist, I need to brew other beer styles like IPAs or something that'll bring the average beer consumer in and have trivia and bingo and stuff like that, which I hit on a lot in my uh, YouTube videos. But um, I didn't want to do those things because I, that just wasn't the thing that made me want to put the work in to start this business in the first place which if you want to run a successful business, those are the things you have to do. You have to sacrifice yeah. and pivot and make changes. I just, and I'll get into it more later, but like I, I started this business in Temple. I live in Austin. So an hour commute uh, each way, every, uh, multiple days a week was draining, but it was worth it if it was like I was doing this specific passion project. It would, uh, never in a million years would I just like start a random generic bar in Temple, Texas, or not yeah. even Temple, an hour away from where I live just to just to have that happen. So I don't know, I could probably find you somewhere in Seguin. If sure, you yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do it in the, outside of the Marble Falls. It'll be great. That one actually might work, but Seguin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, well, I do want to ask you a little bit of questions about like kind of the beer uh, recipes and the core lineup and all that kind of thing. But let's take a quick break first and then come back or know 
where the ideas for recipes came from and how you decided what your cores were going to be. Cool. All right, thanks for sticking in. Andy was nice enough to bring a the last six pack in existence of the ten degrees. Yeah, which we're gonna open right now. And then you're gonna tell me about how this started. Yeah. Okay, so it's a Czech lager recipe. Um, obviously, it's it's made different than some of the other beers that are made in Austin. So you had to have had some ideas in the beginning how you're gonna structure this recipe, what you're gonna do. I don't care if you just found it online and then you know made it well, but how, how did you start with that? And then how did, or which one did you start with, I guess, first? And then how did you become, how did your lineup evolve into what it is? So I initially started with the 10th degree. Um, okay. So this, the beer that we're drinking right now, which is a uh, light pale lager or a light pilsner. So the naming system in the Czech Republic generally is in degrees. So degrees Play-Doh is the unit of measurement for uh, measuring the sugar density of the work before it's fermented. So it's kind of a strength measurement so 10s on the lower end of the spectrum you know 15 16 would be on the medium to higher end of the spectrum so i started off with the lighter pilsner because i was like this is going to be the approachable easy drinking go-to beer the beer temple yeah exactly yeah exactly <laughs> so um uh, people ask about the recipes a lot and they're so simple one they're all published on our website and there's corresponding youtube videos if anybody is interested in brewing these beers check out tinglefootbrewing.com or the youtube channel but I started by um, looking into like traditional Czech recipes and traditional Czech pills is Pilsner malt and sauce hops. Like mm -hmm. that is, that's the recipe. And then the appropriate yeast. So, um, and then the water profile plays a big part of it. So working out the mash bill or the mat, yeah, the, uh, the grain bill wasn't, wasn't like tricky. So, but I did do something a little bit off kilter to like traditional Czech pills in that I, I brewed a few trial batches with just pills and then didn't really get the, the, Kind of decoction character i was looking for because i was just doing a partial decoction decoction is where you pull off a part of the mash and boil it and then reintroduce it um which hardly anybody does hardly anybody does it takes extra time and effort and sometimes equipment i did it in my home brew like what i i did a at a two barrel bat brewery in my garage as i was building the brewery and uh i made a half bison and i decocted it and i was like okay i'm gonna do this when i open and i started looking at it I'm like no i'm not there's yeah. no way i'm gonna do this yeah. it's a huge pain in the ass it is a pain in the ass <laughs> but the way that the uh, Czech pills has all that like nice rounded uh, malt character is because they're generally decocted multiple times. So you're, you're talking about like potentially hours of boiling grain or, or many, many tens of minutes of boiling grain, which yes, imparts that's the temp. Mm -hmm. So like instead of just dropping it in at 150 or whatever, you're going to start lower and, and raise the temperature that way. Yeah. So how many decoctions to do? What were you, what were you trying? Did you, did so you I only did one. So yeah. I only did one partial decoction and the, I only did it for flavor. So a lot of people do or think that you have to do decoction for conversion. That's not true. Um, there, there's different elements to, as far as like caramelization of the, the, the wort and extracting tannins and stuff that aid in flavor, which I was interested in. But anything outside of that, I wasn't. I just wanted just flavor and back. And so I did a couple of batches where I trialed, um, you know, a partial decoction and didn't get exactly the result that I was expecting. So I subsidized the mash with, or the malt bill with a little bit of honey malt from Danburness. So I have like a tiny percentage, maybe like a 1% honey malt addition to the overall mash bill. Mm -hmm. Maybe 2%, I forget what it is. But uh, basically that adds a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of, of caramelized character without like really tasting like a bunch of caramel malt in there. So that was the only kind of like outlier on the recipe that wasn't super traditional. But then, uh, yeah, the, the regular brewing process, mash in, do the partial decoction where you pull off and boil the grain for 10 or 15 minutes, reintroduce it into the mash, and then uh, separate the wort, boil the wort. And then I only use Saz hops, which are grown in the Czech Republic. And um, for the 10 degree, it has, I think it's got like 28 IBUs of bitterness. So it's got a firm bitterness, but not, not overwhelming. And then knock out at 50 degrees and fermentation is really where these beers are what they are because like anybody can produce work it's not difficult and it's it's not difficult to ferment these beers the way that i did anyways it's just time <laughs> time intensive so i have an entire podcast in order to why that's not true but go ahead okay <laughs> well there you go <laughs> um so make the work and then knock it out or cool it down put it into a fermentation vessel at 50 degrees and then pitch the appropriate yeast in this case i used um check pills yeast uh from y yeast which is 2278 and pitch an appropriate amount of yeast Fermentation takes off and creeps, takes about two weeks to, to wrap up like primary fermentation. 
and then crash the beer and cold condition it for the from from like the brew day, the hot side to serving is about two months. So a much, much longer conditioning time than a traditional, you know, pale ale or or even like an American lager. So a lot of same time. Is that because it's needed based on the flavor profile or you just like the flavor? If you want the beer to turn out like this, like there's some other things you can do, like pressure fermentation or expedite the, you know, you could you could really ramp the the temp at the end of fermentation. But basically, in order to achieve the the clean, rounded, um, and bright, the clear beer character of the beers that I brewed, that tank time is necessary. From what I found, mm-hmm. uh, I've served beer at like six weeks before, and it still tastes great. It's just a little hazier, a little bit less polished. And then these beers would end up getting better for weeks after that. So I had several batches of like 12 degree or 13 degree that I had, you know, six months later and they still tasted great. Okay. Well, sidebar before we get into the other products that you have, because I love to call people out and give them a chance to talk shit. Yeah. So what you're talking about is the high temperature diacetyl rest where like you let the creep come up at the end of the fermentation so that it, it reabsorbs all the diacetyl and stuff and then you crash. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you don't do that. No, I do it. Yeah, yeah. You do that. Okay. I do it up to 60 degrees. So technically speaking, you could go as high as you want. I meant more of like, you can, the majority of the ester creation happens in the beginning of fermentation, like the first 48 hours. And so technically speaking, you could raise from the 50 degrees is a, a very cold fermentation temperature and the landscape of beer. Ales are around 68 to 70. So you could theoretically ramp the fermentation temperature up to like 70 degrees, 80 degrees if you wanted near the end of fermentation, it wouldn't, it probably would throw off some extra esters and stuff, but it would, it would, it would make fermentation happen quicker. Yeah. Um, and then pressure fermentation is a whole different game. So why did you choose not to do that? Uh, just cause I, be, I don't know, just cause it worked, <laughs> I guess. Like I just, I got the results that I wanted doing it this way. Um, I had considered like if I wanted to get into larger production or distribution and stuff and, something like that would actually help without sacrificing the mm-hmm. flavor. I don't care. I'm not like, I'm not steadfast. and like, you have to do things a traditional way, but it's my opinion that you don't get these results without doing that. I've not, I've not seen a brewery put out a beer in four weeks that tastes like these beers at two months. I just haven't. And I'm sure there's Some examples. Some Austin do it 14 days. Well, there you go. That's it. <laughs> <Half of Eisen. laughs> oh, I've, there's a, there's a lager made in Austin. That's 14 days. Nice. Now, well, and, and and that fits a specific place in the market, right? Like there there are places for those things, but if you want a beer that is two months old, you gotta yeah. do it. You gotta let it sit two months. Well, you can taste the difference. So yeah. Okay. So did you? How do you decide how many beers you want in your core? Because you're you're on site. You can make the argument that craft beer bars got to have twenty five taps. Mm-hmm. You don't. You have what four? I think at the end. Yeah. Five, maybe? Yeah. So when I started, I had two. Um, so when I opened, I had the 10 degree and the 13 degree. So 13 degree is a Tamave. It's a dark lager. Um, one of the more unique beers that I made here. One of the more popular ones, honestly. But, um, so when I opened, I only wanted two beers because in the, in the Czech Republic, it's, it's not uncommon for a beer bar to serve one beer. Um, and so I just, I like, I love that idea of simplicity. Like you want light or dark. Um, that's like, I just love that idea. But shortly after I opened, I was like, oh man. Like this 10 degrees is great. It's light. It's easy drinking. But I want me personally, I want a 12. I want a premium check pills. I want something with more um, malt character and a more robust like hop flavor and aroma. And so I, I brewed a uh, 12 degree pale lager and that was the third beer to come on uh, the, the tap uh, the tap wall and then released uh, two seasonals throughout the year. So a 22 degree tomate, which is like a stout version of 13, and then a 14 degree polo tomate which is a amber lager, basically a Czech amber lager. So uh, those were the five beers that I brewed and I only had three to four off at any given time. Yeah. How much did you spend on the focus group to pick the names for the beers? Oh, a lot of, a lot of time and money. I, uh, yeah, I traveled all around the country to see which number stuck. No, I just, yeah, I picked 10 and 10 and 13. And then I was like, oh, 12 would be appropriate. Cause like all these numbers are, it's not like I, I didn't just pull them out of my ass. Like, the 12 degree is is the common premium pills like Pilsner Kell is a 12 degree pale lager. Is that a, a name that they typically use there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, okay. I, I've never seen it before you open it. I have seen it since. So yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a traditional naming system. And it's again, the, the Czech beer culture is awesome in that regard where it's like, it's, it's not like you go to a place and instead of being like, Oh, let me get Bob's 
fancy pale ale, you're like, what's your 10? What's your 10? What's your 12? Yeah, it's just give me your representation of this very um, blank canvas of a style. So, okay. Well, so obviously, in a lot of ways, we're going to talk about what went wrong. But first, the second half, let's talk about what went right. So as you were opening it, what were your wins? Like, where did you go and you walk in and you're killing it like a keg every three days to sell an house off site or, or whatever what was the events that worked for you like yeah there were no sales metrics that were <laughs> killing it uh but uh my biggest wins were building this bar was probably the most fun i had yeah um and building the brand so i designed the logo i'm very proud of the brand and the logo and the whole kind of like the vibe of the brand um so very very proud about that uh, building this bar and building this vibe in here, like I was very happy with the, the outcome. I really liked the vibe in here when people were in here drinking beers and, and stuff like that. Um, got, there were a couple of, I mean, I'm pretty cynical after being in the industry for 12 years. So like accolades and awards and stuff don't, don't really, I don't, I don't seek out that type of approval, but having a, like having really solid feedback about the quality of the beer has been nice, especially from people like in the industry that like know, beer and they're like oh i really like this this execution of the style that's been nice uh and then the just the community of people that i kind of the community i built here in temple of people that are like oh this is like an important part of the beer scene in temple and sucks that it's gone now but like i think that it definitely impacted this area like changed things for the better so yeah well did you have any like just great events or anything that worked for you i mean that's some events you said were oh yeah yeah. parties in there like yeah, so I only did a couple of parties a year. Um, I did. I had the the twenty two degree Tamabe release was always a good one. So I would can up uh, sixteen ounce versions of the twenty two degree, the stout version of the Tamabe, and every time I released that, you know, sold quite a bit of those. Um, so for context, like you know, my sales days in here were usually abysmal. Like sometimes below a hundred dollars, sometimes like 150 bucks or whatever, just like nothing, but like kind of kept at it. Like, Oh, it'll grow. It'll grow. It'll grow. But then would do like the, the tomato release and had like an $800 day the first time. And then yeah. the second time I did, it had a $1,500 day. And then, um, the last, the biggest parties that I had were last year's anniversary party. So the second year anniversary party was like, a I was like a $2,800 sales day or something like that. And then this year, uh, was like a 30, one hundred dollar sales day or something like i don't know something like that um and so like that for one person uh, basically i did all the work and i had a couple people help me wash glasses during those parties but yeah for like one person pouring that many beers like it was pretty good pretty good days but made up for the 70 dollar thursdays <laughs> didn't it never did made up for the the <laughs> 364 other days of the year that were not that but yeah it was uh those were highlights for sure we actually had a um I think it was a th- I think it was a seventeen dollar Thursday once, and so I I kept I took a photo of the receipt. We kept it in the brewery, and everything was measured against. Well, could yeah. be worse. Yeah, it's not a seventeen dollar Thursday. I think I also <laughs> my lowest day was a seventeen dollar Thursday, which is hilarious. Maybe that's yeah. just like how the how the world works. It just yeah, and that's kind of like, and we'll get into that in the next part, I'm sure. But yeah, that's the the those moments in the moment like. The negativity of that outshadow is like all the positive moments. You're like, God, dude, this just sucks. Uh, but yeah, there were some good moments in there for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what was the jump like when you went from your small system to your big system? How'd you pick it? How'd you decide what to do? And then did you have to wait for like, forever to get it? Like, what was that experience like? No, it was, it was very serendipitous. I had, um, so I bought my second system, which was a basically four barrel volumetrically, um, a, a brew house and, uh, fermentation vessels and glycol chiller, all that from Blue Bonnet Brewing in Round Rock. And they just happened to come in here one day uh, to grab a beer. Like, hey, we've heard about you and come uh, check out the lager. And they were sitting down and I was chatting them up and I'd known them from the industry and uh, was like, yeah, so what do y'all, you know, how's it going there? And they're like, oh, we just got these seven barrel tanks in. And long story short, they basically upgraded their system. And I asked them what they were doing with their old system I said, it's just in storage. I said, I'm, I might buy it from you if you want. And uh, they said that could work out. So I uh, went and looked at it, talked about price, and then bought it, and then moved everything in uh, April of 2022, got everything set up, and yeah, just uh, tra- transitioned over to the new system in a very uh, shitty way. <laughs> I uh, had to dump the first two batches that I brewed, which was a big kick in the nuts, but just didn't turn out right or did you- yeah so the the system the 
the system didn't have um, enough BTUs to boil the volume. So they they were splitting their boils between two kettles, which I was like, now nah, I'll just make it work with, you know, I'll put the two burners out or something. Anyways, basically I was trying to max out the boil kettle with not enough BTUs. And so I didn't have a rolling boil. So my two pale loggers had DMS. And then, and so they sat in tanks for like four weeks, five weeks. And I just kept smelling. I was like, dude, something's no not right. And, uh, and so I just dumped it and ended up closing for like six weeks. But anyways, yeah, go ahead, pants. you live and you learn. Yeah. So did you do uh, like festivals and events at this time? Did you have enough beer for any of that? No. So I didn't really have enough beer ever to do offsite stuff. I did a couple of offsite events. Um, did one event in Belton called Bacon and Blues Festival and then did another another event at another brewery in Salado called Barrow Brewing. The problem, though, was, one, I didn't have beer to, like, justify sending kegs into distro or, or whatever. Like, yeah. Yeah, give it away or whatever it was. Couldn't justify that. And then, two, events always happen on the weekend, and I was here working it. So it's like I need to either close the business and go do this event where I probably won't make any more money or get somebody to work here and go do the event and pay them and probably pay them more than we take in the full day. So it just, yeah, it just never really worked out financially to do those things. And it was kind of in a weird time of, you know, right now is a weird time of craft beer in general, but like events kind of over the last year and a half have just not had the attendance that people have been expecting. And so it just like you go and you set up for this event and you expect to sell out, you know, two full kegs of beer and be done and, four hours and they end up leaving with a, a keg full of beer. You're like, oh man, that only, I mean, I, I didn't participate in a bunch of events, but um, <laughs> the I one had. time that I did, if I had, yeah, the one time I did, yeah, I left with more beer than I expected. And the people, several breweries next to me were like, yeah, this is like a third of the beer that we sold last year at the same event. So yeah, changing tides for, for events as well. It's tough. I don't think it's come back since COVID. I don't, I don't know if people just sort of got like a moment where they could think about it and decided that it wasn't as fun as they remember. Yeah. Or if they just don't go out in public anymore. It seems like we still have crowds at bars and, or whatever. There, I, I'm I'm of the opinion that it's it's not that people aren't going out like as much as they were. I do think that that is the case, but it's more significantly about people people's patterns have changed fundamentally. Like people, there isn't the Thursday happy hour is always going to be busy. Like it mm -hmm. used to be like, there used to be these, these markers of like St. Patty's day will be the day or whatever it is. It, yeah. Like, and so, but I've seen that completely be, it can just turn up on its head because these days that we used to have not here at Tanglefoot, but like at the other brewery I ran that were like, no brainer. We're going to be busy for this day. This thing's going on are just now hit or miss. So, I don't know. I think, I think, uh, yeah, just the patterns and the way people move them go up in the world has changed. Yeah. I'm no psychologist. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't have a podcast. I'd have a consulting company if I knew the answer. Uh -huh. but, right. Um, so with, let's talk a little bit about like you, you made it very clear in your closing announcement, which we'll get to a little bit too, but that you weren't meeting the sales expectations here on site that you had. So regardless of what they were, 5 million a day two $2 a day, um, how was that falling short and how did that look? Like, obviously you get frustrated, but were there things that you could do to help? Was there anything that kind of worked? Like, Yeah. The, th the things that would have worked and did work to some degree was like, you know, having events on a regular cadence is, is if you want to open a, a tap room brewery like your, and I'll go on the diatribe later in the, <laughs> in the podcast, I'm sure. But basically if you want to open a tap room focused brewery, not the distribution and the, the business, then you're, you're a hospitality business, you're an event space. And so having events on a regular cadence that people can rely on and expect and, and getting the messaging out there through your social media channels, that will obviously impact people get coming in through the door. Having something new for people, having a new beer release, having new you know food options, whatever it is. So um, if I had had that on a regular cadence, obviously would have helped in the few events that I did do. Um, I did them very cautiously because I know that sometimes you can lose your ass on events. If you have like four bands booked and you're expecting, you know, 400 people to come by and 20 people come out, you're screwed. You still have to pay the bands, you know, a thousand dollars or whatever it is. So, um, I tried not to extend myself financially on events like that, but, um, in the events like the anniversary party and stuff like that, that always works out. 
But um, yeah, if I had more regular events, I think that would have been helpful. Having food options. So we talked about me opening in a barbecue restaurant, but this was no longer a barbecue restaurant after the first year. I mean, there's still some stuff back there, but then there hasn't been food in operation here in in a year and a half. So um, I didn't have any food option for the last year and a half of being in business and um, only had food trucks out a couple of times, but I was always hesitant about that because my sales were so low. And if somebody's gonna come and commit to set up for you know five hours, six hours, and they're not getting any business, it just, I feel coming from a food background, I'm like, I feel for those people. So um, that aspect is tricky if you don't have a consistent food option. And um, yeah, just overall, like, you know, serving the market that you're in. Like I, I, I'm fully aware that like this business model was not great to begin with. It was never going to be this like gangbusters thing. But um, if I were to start from scratch and like do it all over again, the obvious things like have the food, have the events, have the playscape, have the outdoor patio environment that's dog friendly and kid friendly and all the, you know, all the stuff that the modern day brewery taproom um, should have. Okay. Well, on that note, we're going to take a break. And then when we get back, we're going to talk a little bit about um, why you did do those things uh-huh. and why... Um, how you know they would work and just kind of what went wrong and what went, what fell apart and what that experience was like. So sure. let's go run around the block, see if we can find some more beer stuck in the back and we'll be back in a minute. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're ready to talk about it. So tell me, how how did it go? Like what was the, what was your emotional state like and what were, because obviously no one closes overnight, right? You think about it, you put it off, you try one more thing, you pivot, you move. Um, I did that for years. <laughs> <laughs> well, it cost me a lot of money and almost my marriage. But what um what what did you do? Like what what was it like? Yeah, that's it. That's really interesting because it we live in our like as entrepreneurs we just live in our head constantly, and so like yeah. I felt isolated for the last year and a half in my business. Just like felt super isolated, couldn't talk to anybody about these things. So I will give you credit in the podcast credit that listening to these stories has really helped shape some of the decisions that I've made. Because there's this, I think it's Jim Carrey. There's a quote, but basically he talks about his dad and he's like, you can fail at doing something you hate. So why not do something you love? And even if you like, even right. if you still fail, yeah. you, you may still fail. So why not do something that you're passionate about? And so that was in the back of my mind with this concept the whole time and hearing these stories on the podcast about like, we did the pivots, we did the new beer, we did the different releases, we did all these things. We, we went into distribution hard. We pulled back from distribution and that still cannot work out. So doing the things that I knew would not bring me joy or not like get me to the point to where I wanted to be in my life um, made it a little bit easier for me to be like, you know what, I'm going to keep, I'm I'm still going to stay convicted about this particular thing. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out on my terms. But um, for the last year that I was open, I was kind of in the back of my mind, like this sucks. Like this is not going the way that I wanted. So for context, like my first year I did, I was open like one day a week and then eventually two days a week. And I did like $17,000 in revenue, something like low, but I was still working full time at Blackstar. Mm -hmm. Second year, I did like 30 grand in revenue. And this was like two days open and whatever, still part time working at Blackstar. Then I came on full time and I was open three days a year. And it was like on pace for something like 50 grand or 60 grand in revenue, like bleak, right? Like, like, yeah. yeah. And so it's like, there's growth there and there's like, yeah, if you waited out 10, 15 years, maybe that works into a business that you're happy with. But I frankly was not willing to to wait that long because I was already, I was, I opened this business in hopes that like it would grow and I could potentially be the beer of temple. And if it got to a scale, then maybe I could, you know, I could have somebody managing it while I lived in Austin or, or whatever, maybe some compromise moving halfway but I never planned to move to Temple. So that was in the back of my mind the whole time. So I get to year two and a half and I'm like, things aren't really moving the way that I thought they were moving. And if I'm here in two years doing the same thing with like marginally better revenue, I'll hate myself. And so that was a big, big uh, factor in me making the decision. And then ultimately what came down to it was I, you know, revenue started to dip again. Like I think early this, what year is this? 2024. Early in 2024, it it dipped a little bit, and I was just like... Just year over year, or...? Yeah, well, c- kind of relative. Like, it, I was up year over year, but it, it was still kind of, like, relative to what it was in... Maybe it was, like, right in, like, Q2, when Q2 began, something like that. I just noticed sales kind of plateauing a little bit, and I was like, man, that's... 
it just doesn't feel good. I had some momentum going into the new year, and then I had to, I didn't even mention I had to close again. Uh, I had an infection in the brewery, and so I dumped all my beer, closed for another six weeks at the beginning of the year. So opened up and had all this momentum after closing a rebrewing old beer, had great sales for a couple of weeks, and then sales kind of plateaued, but then they kind of lowered a little more, and I was like, man, I'm like right back in the same headspace. I cleared my head after being closed for weeks yeah. and was like rejuvenated, felt good about like, you know, coming into the new year, making changes, and then just got right back into the same mental position and was like, yeah, this just, there's, this isn't going to work. It's not going to change. It's not going to, it's not going to work out. So really it was just a matter of like, when am I going to close? And so that was, I probably made my decision in like March of this year. And then like slowly, like just kept thinking about it, kept thinking about it. And then, uh, yeah, I made the decision in late, uh, May. Is that when I announced it? I don't know. I made the decision in like late May or early June. And then I closed in shit. Well, I think you gave three weeks. Yeah. So it would have been probably early June. Yeah. Uh, okay. So there are people listening to the show, obviously that, you know, they've heard other people on the show, what they've tried, the industry rhetoric of all the things they need to do to change it. And when the outgoing president of the Brewer Association said it was just collaboration and innovation. That's all you got to do. But, um, no, for real though, like you had some of these options, right? Like you didn't brew a hazy IPA. You, uh, you didn't put in food. Um, obviously these were on the table. What exactly were the reasons that you didn't do it? You alluded to some of it, but. Let's say the hazy IPA, for example. If you knew for a fact the hazy IPA would save, or let's say it's a hazy check, I don't fuck you want to call Whatever, it. Yeah. If you knew it was going to save the brewery, why wouldn't you try it? Uh, and there's no right answer. I'm not trying No, to I know. Yeah, yeah. Two things. One, ego, for sure. Just ego and pride about, like, I made this decision. I'm sticking with it. Mm-hmm. But two, also, the like, I alluded to it earlier. I had no desire to do anything. And this has nothing to do with the town of Temple, Texas. I just live an hour away. Mm-hmm. I don't, I didn't have plans on moving to Temple. That was never in the, the the future for me. So I had zero desire to run any business in Temple, Texas. That wasn't this model. And so that was kind of the like, it does. I don't agree that the hazy IPA would have been the thing that like, I'm sure you don't think yeah, that I don't that think, would have, I don't think any of that. I know would somebody listening to the show, I think it would be. <laughs> yeah. So like, I don't think there's one silver bullet for any of these things, but like, even if it was, I didn't want to run a hazy IPA brewery in Temple, Texas. I didn't want to run a car wash in Temple, Texas. I like, I didn't want to do these things that weren't me brewing, bringing check lager to Temple, Texas. Like anything outside of that scope was kind of like, it was just off the table. And I think I did a poor job of communicating that in some of the YouTube videos where I, I got, and, you know, I've had some feedback about like, oh, you just didn't want to put the work in. And you just didn't want to like, you, you're a big you, yeah, you didn't want to do the sacrifices that, you know, you talk uh, about these things, but you didn't want to do the, the work, yeah. but, but which is true, but out of specifically out of the desire of like, I don't want to build, uh, I don't want to build my life somewhere that I don't want to live. Like you just, None of that aligned. So that was the main driving force behind not making changes um, that could have, you know, I'm doing air quotes, could have yeah. theoretically saved the brewery was that I, I would be building something that was in a, a town an hour where I lived, uh, an hour away from where I lived. Okay. Well, in the danger of, of saying things that might make for shitty radio, I'm going to ask you the questions anyway, so just, you can just give me the same answers if you want. But yeah. what about the idea of hiring a part-time brewer and that brewer brews for you and you don't have to actually come into it? So you couldn't afford it. I assume you had thought about it, right? So Yeah, I couldn't afford it. I couldn't afford anything. I was just, I mean, the business lost money for the last, I mean, most of the time that it was open. I put money in and um, yeah, like I was just living off tips and a lot of these stories from even people in town that have started like little businesses that have closed or whatever um, and other small towns, like I didn't have another income. This was my income. So I was living on tips from, that were very small from the tap room and a very small amount of money that I transferred to myself, but it was basically like I was living off savings that I had already put into the business bank account. So yeah, it, it just, there was no option to do anything outside of that unless I wanted to take a gamble. Like, Hey, let me take out a hundred thousand dollar loan and like have somebody brew the beer and sell it. And I didn't have to touch it. Yeah. But that's just, it wasn't the reality. We've, we've had guests that have done that too. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the, it, unfortunately to the same result. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So, what about the idea of contract brewing somewhere else and then just uh, moving like the tasting room to Austin or something? So that's something that is like kind of tentatively in the back of my mind, not from a business perspective, because um, I think I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but one of the big 
one of the big driving forces behind not pursuing things in the industry outside of like the ego and then not wanting to do things outside of uh, check loggers and temple was that when I started, when I started this business, I started getting really interested in like the concept of running a business and all of the signs pointed to like, this is not a good business to run. And like, Are you uh, sure? yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in my opinion, I'll, I'll say that Got it. Sure. in my opinion, I, it's like the, re- the outcome for the amount of work um, and sacrifice that you put into it is monetarily not, in my opinion, worth it. For if that's the goal, if the goal is to run like a good business that makes money, and my brain quickly switched to like, I kind of want to see what it's like to run a good business that makes money. And so all signs kind of pointed to this is not the model that will get you there. So that I wanted to mention that before I said the thing about contract brewing and that I may end up doing some sort of contract brewing, some sort of like licensing or contract brewing to have the beer exist. Because I built um, I built a pretty decent audience on YouTube and had a lot of people that reach out to me and like would love to try the beer that just never got a chance. And so I'd like to at least have the beers available, not because it'll make money, but like hopefully won't lose money, but we'll just have beer be available so that I can continue like growing the brand online and just building something around the Tanglefoot beer brand. But uh, yeah, not as far as a like a business model. That's not something that I think is viable. Yeah. Well, it's curious. I'm curious how you would struggle with um, on that note. Like when I was considering what I was going to do with my brewery, so I'm 19, I wrote the book, I started the book. One of the things I wanted to do was contract brew, and we made all mixed culture beer. So there's like green breweries in the entire state of Texas that could do it. That everybody else would be terrified. Yeah. Um, for very op- opposite reasons, I think you'd have a hard time finding a contract brewer who would make things with this, make your beer as good as you do for a variety of reasons. So, like, from the authenticity piece, how do you, do you struggle with that? Like if somebody else were to make it, do you still want your name on it? Would you trust it to be the same? Like, Yeah, the kind of the vision that I had was like, I say contract brewing because I think it's a term that people kind of generally understand, but there's more of a, uh, it would be more like of a licensing play and that if I could get an entity to brew the beer under my like, either my strict guidance or like me actually brewing the beer, basically utilizing one of their tanks and they own the beer, they own the like, TBC label or whatever. And then I would just be responsible for, for moving it. Um, and then as long as the equipment was, you know, sound equipment, I mean, my equipment sucked. So, <laughs> or didn't suck, but it like, it wasn't anything fancy. So like you can make great beer on any system in my opinion. And so if they had a decent system that could do the things I wanted it, then yeah, I wouldn't feel, I think it's possible. Okay. Well, you said in one of your videos and I'm curious now if it's changed because yeah, you know, obviously some things are situational, but, uh, you said that part of the problem when you end up closing was that you fell out of love with the concept of brewing or the activity of brewing. Has that changed? Have you gotten the bug back? Or? No, no, definitely not. No, the, I, more of, yeah, to be fair, like I, the actual physical aspect of, of putting grain into a mash tun and mixing it and then like switching valves and like that part of it doesn't interest me like it used to. Obviously, I've been doing it for you know over 10 years. Um, but really it came down to like, I'm tired of sweating my ass off the second that I get like for my, my livelihood. Like mm-hmm. I, I, I would come into the brewery here at Temple in uh, Tanglefoot and just in the back area where my system was situated, it was, you know, it'd be like 110 degrees and as soon as you turn on the burner and then you're just drenched and sweat and it's just miserable. And I just, that is not something that I want to do <laughs> on a daily basis. Like every now and then it's fine and it's fun and I still... I still think about it. Um, like I did, I brewed a collaboration beer uh, a week ago with Zilker Brewing in Austin. And, you know, I was there, I like grind out. I like, you know, whatever, did very basic stuff. And that stuff is fun. But yeah, the day-to-day of brewing is is not, I don't think it's really glamorized anymore, but it's just physical labor. Like you're just moving mm-hmm. hot liquid around and you're sweating. And if you're into that, do it. I just, I've done it. That right. a lot. <laughs> when it's rewarding in the beginning, obviously, yeah. yeah but then at the, that the shine gets off the turret or whatever they say after yeah. a while. So yeah. Um, and I assume was the brew house at Blackstar was that air conditioned? It was. Yeah. So <laughs> I was spoiled for the first several years so of my mine. brewing career. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, it makes a difference too. You know, it could be like that, but the steam out of it, it was so expensive to put that in. Yeah. Us, it was yeah. No, it's, yeah. I think that was like a ma- like a major line item in the brew house build out at Blackstar was like here's this AC unit just just because it's it'll be nice yeah um, but in that type of environment you kind of it's you kind of have to it's like a, a retail space in a mixed-use development but yeah 
Yeah, brewing in a warehouse in Texas is is bridal. So shout out to all the all the brewers out there that are doing it. Uh, yes, my respect. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So how did you? And, and I'm going to link the video. People can talk and take a look at what you explained and like how you talked about when you're going to close. But how did you decide what to do? So you gave us two weekends to drink, which wasn't enough for me, obviously, because mm-hmm. I didn't make it. But um, why not a month? Why not? Yeah. Three months. Like, what, why not just ride off into the sunset? Why did you decide what you decide? So I actually gave y'all three weekends on accident. Uh, yeah, so I posted a video about... How not to close a brewery. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I posted a video of like when I was going to close. I made up my mind and I felt really good about it. And to be clear, I still feel very good about it. Like I, I feel like absolutely the right decision to make. But I posted this video. I was like, you know what? I don't want to do this, drag it out over a month. Because ultimately what happens, and this is true for even if it's like a special event, at your brewery, like if there's a big date where everything like culminates and like a bunch of people will be there for this closing event or whatever, the weeks preceding it will be slow. Like it, mm. it just will like they're saving up. Yeah. Yeah. People are saving up and they're waiting. So, um, yeah. So I was like, I don't want to do it for like a whole month, but I also don't want to just like close next week. Cause I just like, there's, I have a bunch of people in Austin that are supporters and like people on the YouTube channel and stuff. And I, I'll touch on that in a second, but, um, yeah, I just wanted to give a few weeks so that people could come in, but I announced it and I said the 22nd and I thought that that was like in, in another week. So it would be like two full weekends, but it actually ended up being in three in three full weekends away from when I posted it. So everybody lucked out and got an extra week, which ended up working out um, for everybody. But yeah, I just, I don't know. I just picked a date and was like, that's it. I didn't want to overthink it either. Cause like, it's pretty easy to be like, well, if we did it this way or we did it this way and we don't want to disappoint these people. So we'll make this concession, but we don't want to disappoint these people. So we'll do this. So I just was like, this is my business and it's only me that does it. I don't have to worry about like, I'm, I'm, I'm firing employees that have to go now find jobs. Yeah. I was like, it's just me. Do they show up the last day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, it's just me and I'm just going to do this thing and I'm going to close. And I hope y'all come out and celebrate and, you know, drink what little beer I have left. Um, so that was it. Yeah. Let's we'll talk about how it went. Well, you had two weeks or three weekends really, but, Two yeah. that were on the books. Yep. Um, typically, revenue is higher. People come out. Yeah. Did you have good days? Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about that part first. So, what what's the what was the fun part? Did you make some money? Yeah, yeah, I actually <laughs> did make money for the first time in a long time. Um, so, I had a couple of good days the first weekend because everybody was like that initial shock of like, oh my gosh, he's closing. Yeah. A bunch of regulars came out, uh, and then had some. You know, the second weekend was a little bit slower, and then third weekend was was pretty busy with the, the final day being the busiest day I ever had. Um, but yeah, I, um, I, I just got to see a lot of people, just a ton of support. A lot of people, I mean, everybody hears the same stuff. I'm sure like, Oh my gosh, I love your beer. Oh my God. It was, yo, why don't you just stay open? I had a few people. Like, I'm never going to drink again. Yeah. Yeah. A few people like really pitching me to be like, dude, you got to stay open. See all these people are coming out. And I'm like, okay, that is just huge fallacy. This is like, of course people are going to come out if you're closing. They want to do that though. When it's busy at the yeah. end, they're all like, what if we're just like this every weekend? But I knew I had that in my mind. I was yeah. already like, there's no way this is going to sway me. Um, so it was good and it had, there was closure too. And I was like, yeah, this is like, this is great. And when it was busy in here, like the last day was the kind of like the, the ideal, obviously like the, the busiest sales day I ever had, but it was like the ideal situation. Like my girlfriend's band came in, they played some tunes, but nothing crazy. Like I never really wanted music to be a part of the, the thing. Like if we had some every now and then that's fine. But so she came in and played some songs, but the place was just packed all day long people were buying six packs in the beginning and then I sold out immediately and people were drinking several beers and they were all sitting together and they were all talking. And it was like, that's exactly what I wanted the vibe to be. Like people just come the in, whole time. have <laughs> a good time. Like if it was, it's so cliche, but yeah, if, it, if every day was like that day, it would have been a great business, but it just, there's no way it would have been. So it was nice to, uh, to put the cherry on top. And luckily I got out of here at a reasonable hour. Cause I know there's, there's definitely, I've heard some horror stories, not horror stories, but like some, some stories of people being like, oh man, we're up there till four in the morning that last night. And I was like, dude, I'm fucking tired. I'm yeah. going home. I had to drive to Austin after I was done. You know, an hour. I was yeah. exhausted. I'm so tired. Um, but yeah, no, it was good. Yeah. Any uh, emotional conversations or anything like, uh, you were wor- obviously working, touring most yeah. of the day, but did I you get a chance to stop and reflect? Like, did- This is going to sound pretty like, uh, arrogant, I would say, but I felt like, like I felt bad for my regulars. I yeah. like, like, like not, like not that my beer is so amazing or whatever. This place is so amazing, but like 
they really liked it here. And they really found like, they had like a little group in a community here and they had like this, this spot that they really enjoyed in Temple that was kind of outside the norm of what was available in Temple and still is. Uh, and so I felt bad like that they wouldn't have this type of place to go to, but I was also at the same time like, I did what I could do and I'm, I'm happy with how it's ending. I, I, I felt, felt pretty, uh, pretty, pretty like everything closed out at the end of the night. I was like, I put everything I could into that day in particular. Like I was, I was dog tired after that service, but like I, I made all the beers. I, I gave people the beers. I educated the people about the beers and I did everything I wanted to do. And, Except make the money. That was it. <laughs> that was the, the only thing. The, little one, thing. the one detail that I couldn't do. Wow. Uh, you're in good company. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know many that are. So we're actually going to push that conversation to the next segment. That's cool. when we really talked all of our shit. But I want to ask you right out of the gates when we get back, why didn't it work for you? There's so many other breweries in the area. Oh, fine. Right. We'll grab that. All right. This is the fourth and final segment. Once again, I appreciate you sticking in here. And now is the time. I want to talk a little bit of shit. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But so tell me, and, and I'm not probably near as aware of the Austin craft beer scene as you are, but there aren't, there aren't that many breweries closing. So there are some, but like, what do you think is the difference? Why, why does your brewery close? And Temple's not the only reason, but I'll let you say one of them. But uh, why does your brewery close and a lot of these other ones that make beer that is empirically not as good? There's no argument. They are still open. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so many factors, right? You don't know the books. Like it, it's, I, I think there's a lot of that is like cutting losses. Like I, I was not happy to close, but I was okay with closing. Like I, I was like, I don't want to try to try to squeeze blood out of a rock. And, and a lot of people don't feel that way. A lot of people would rather have it like, you know, six or keep, keep perpetuating it and trying to make it work for another 10 years. And I'm not saying that is the case for everybody, but yeah, like I know a lot of brewers and breweries, in Austin and, and pretty much every single one of them seems to be struggling in some, some capacity. And there's some that are doing better than others, but I think ultimately it comes down to, you know, is there funding behind it? Is there, cause, cause if everybody didn't, if every brewery that was open had no funding, there was no other money behind it other than the, just the cash flow of the business. Like they would close like absolutely objectively, especially during downturn seasons. But uh, often there's, there's money that is, is kind of propping, businesses up and that's what gets you through like the hard months and the hard years and stuff. But, um, I don't think it's like, I don't think there's one answer. I think there's unique circumstances. Like the reason this place was open for so long, if I had real rent and real, um, like overhead and staff, like we would have been closed two years ago. <laughs> yeah. It just, it wouldn't have worked. Um, but because like my grandmother owns the building and so I had really cheap, if not any rent, uh, certain months. And it just, the circumstances that, that led to me being open, allowed me to stay open longer because I had very low overhead. But uh, yeah, maybe some some other breweries have that situation too, where they they own the building and they don't have to pay uh, crazy rent. Or, yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't love naming names, but I think that's our rap with, uh, not, what am I thinking? Uh, the, what's the Amber? Thirsty Goat. Oh, they yeah, had yeah, different yeah. companies. And so the other company that owned the building, they weren't getting rent for a while, but so it took it took a lot longer than it should have. Yeah, had the books all been one, they'd been like, "Oh fuck, we're we're not, we can't buy grains." Like you know, yeah. but they just didn't pay rent for a minute. I think you see a lot of that. Um, at the end of the day, we we joked in our brewery, was, um, we probably put half a million bucks in it, and and uh, so we didn't have debt, we didn't have you know equipment to pay off, we had not even the finish out, we had, we had no actual recurring debt monthly. If we had the right amount of debt to justify what we were doing. We would have closed a long time ago. Yeah, because it just wouldn't have made sense. Yeah, I've been very debt averse for years to the point where like my credit score is like nothing. But, but like I yeah. just I don't carry debt. But yeah, when I started this business, no debt. I just had money from savings that I put into it, and my family actually gave me a little uh, loan to to kind of help you know potentially expand or do whatever. But and I'm I'm about to just pay uh, pay them back, write them a check for all that. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know how I could have done it, and to give some some other context, like being around the beer scene during COVID, which like this business only existed during COVID, which was kind of weird. Mm. Um, but being around the beer scene during COVID and seeing like, there's a lot of places, not breweries specifically, like just retail restaurants and stuff like that, that got a lot of funding from the government to, um, you know, the PPP and the EIDL funding, which was needed to happen. Like these places would have all been closed, but revenue is not necessarily 
bounce back the way that it was before. Mm. And so those funds are still kind of like helping people get get through the tough times, which I, I do think is a great thing. But it still is like I don't I don't have the answer. I don't think anybody really has the answer. And it's circumstantial to each business. Some businesses have a much better business model. Some businesses overhead is much lower than other businesses. And some places have just tap room and no distribution. And so they have they capture all the margin and running the events and um, hospitality business. And it seems like that's a better better model than the the mass distribution one so yeah i get to it's just hard the, at the end of the day i think the biggest issue with the brewing industry and i obviously have a microphone in front of me i'm going to say my opinion but is is the lack of scale and so this business has always been scale oriented from the beginning for yeah. years any manufacturing um, there was an episode i did uh i don't know which one it was but it was on clint Lanier's book about people's beer from the 60s i think might be like early 70s and at the time in that book, he talked about how there was, you know, a, I think it was Pabst that fucked somebody over, or like, you know, forced a closure or whatever. And so the government did a study and they were trying to get rid of these assets in like 1970. They were like, for someone to open a brewery who could compete against Pabst at that time in that money was 300, 300, no, it was like $8 million they needed yeah. to be able to be, be competitive. Yeah. Scale that to today. Like thirty million bucks or something. What the fuck are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> Why are we? I make a a joke about this that is you know, again pretty cynical, but like this industry was built on passion. That's what kind of keeps these places going, right? It was like the the brewery labor is is relatively physical and hard labor that is relatively not highly paid. Um, mm-hmm. That does have technical skills, and like you know, there's a lot of skill sets that are needed to be a good brewer that could transfer to pharmaceutical in- industry or it's some it's other industry work. it's hard work but it takes some some knowledge as well so like you could make more money in other industries with comparable skill set oh, skill set but a lot of people stay in this industry because of the passion and and all that stuff but the point to all that is i, I like name another industry that is manufacturing based I, i'm not talking about the retail side of things like there's a difference between the like tap room business model and distribution we're talking about the distribution side where like the margins suck, super capital intense, very, very like huge hassle factor, all that stuff. Um, but name another industry where like is manufacturing based that is boutique. Like you don't have a boutique tire manufacturer in your town. Like there's Austin's tires. Like we we do a hundred, we do a thousand tires a year, but they're great and they're boutique and they're unique to you. And mm-hmm. like, you don't have manufacturing handmade facilities. That, yeah. Handmade tire. Like you don't free range organic and, tires. And that sounds real <laughs> shitty and cynical. Um, but at the basis of the business, it is manufacturing. So it's like large, heavy equipment, economies of scale. And generally you want those to be in like very cheap, wide in, or heavy industrial, like parts of town where a lot of breweries are in more, desirable retail parts of town because they're, they're trying to draw traffic to their tap room. So it's this, it's this weird, I don't know, dichotomy between you've got this large manufacturing business that like the answer is obvious it's scale and having money to like build and, and attack like a segment in the market versus, Oh, but we also want like you to come here for bingo on Tuesday. Yeah. So it's, yeah, there's a identity crisis in beer for sure. And has been for years, but uh, my two cents on that is that if you are getting into the beer industry and you do want to start a brewery, even though you've listened to all these podcast episodes, um, pick one and ideally don't pick the distribution side. Cause like, I, I don't see a way for that to work under like 50,000 barrels, but even that, you're, or, you're not going to get 50,000. You know, I shouldn't even say that. Cause like, I don't have the metrics or the numbers for that. I just don't, I think that that is a poor business model to choose versus the higher margin on site retail model. But knowing that if you do decide to go with that, like the beer is kind of fifth on the list of importance of things that you need when you open, like you need location, you need food, you need family friendly, you need space, parking, uh, shit, maybe even eighth on the list and then beer. And if you break down the economics of it, the difference in profit margin between brewing beer on site and just selling kegs of beer that you bought from a distributor really doesn't benefit you until you get above like five, 800 barrels of beer sold on site. Mm-hmm. Like, and if you're expecting to sell that much beer, great, go for it, do it. But yeah, you know, don't trick yourself and thinking like, like I did, this is all, this is just a therapy session for me, right? Like this is all just therapy. Let, let it out, bro. Let it out. Yeah. But like, it, it just doesn't make economic sense to brew 200 barrels of beer and sell it on site versus like just opening a beer bar that sells 200 barrels of beer. Like it just doesn't make any sense. 
I did the math in my book actually. I was like, because I looked at our we said we put guest beer in during COVID, like maybe it was twenty one, but end of twenty twenty one twenty one something like that. And you could see that some things were selling faster, and we made very esoteric products, right? And tourists come in. We were selling some things faster than ours, and so I was like, I wonder how this works. And I wrote the whole spreadsheet and I worked it all down. If I were to buy a keg of live oak pills, was the number I used um, at. I think it was one fifty they charge or one sixty at the time, and that sells in this period of time. It would have been more profitable for me to just stop making beer completely and just sell those. Yeah. I don't want to do that. But like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the crux though, is that we don't want to do those yeah. things. Yeah. Nobody, if you went to all of the breweries in the country that sold less than 500 barrels of beer and you sh- presented them these numbers as an objective third party and said, hey, you'll make more money if you cease brewing and just sell beer. They'd be like, well, I don't want to just run a beer bar. Like, because that's not why people get into the industry. They yeah. want to brew a product and share with people and the status of it. Like, I made this and all that stuff. And if you're okay with it not being a an ideal business model, that's fine. Like, you can. There are plenty of businesses that you know, multimillionaire opens a brewery and just wants it to exist, and they have the funds to keep it alive. And I think that's great. Go for it. Oh, you're seeing more of those now, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so, what are you gonna do next? What's on the horizon? Um, in the short term, you're still going to tear this place apart, I guess. But yeah, well, I mean, I already sold my equipment, so yeah. that's a huge part of it. Um, the family owns a building, so they're gonna they're gonna sell it. Um, but I personally, and I started doing some consulting work, um, just a little bit of uh, part time consulting. Currently, maybe scale that up and do a little bit more uh, over time. But I'm also going to be working with another company, doing some like draft installation, uh, helping out um, with some projects that they have coming up and then keep the YouTube channel going. So continue to grow the YouTube channel and do more uh, general beer content. I think like less, obviously less specific about growing a small brewery, but more about like, I, I just did a a video about a collaboration uh, I did with another brewery in Austin called Zilker Brewing. And I want to do some more kind of like things about beer that are still intriguing to me, like the beer experiences that I find to be exceptional. So I'll, I'll continue to do stuff like that. And then, Ultimately, I'd like to start another business, Uh, may or may not be within the alcohol space, but a business um, intrigues me. I'm interested in running a business uh, that actually makes money. So what do you think the odds are of being the alcohol business? Probably, frankly, pretty low. Um, If I could do something that is that serves the beer industry, that would be ideal. But I mean, everything that I've learned about business, you know, from YouTube and and other entrepreneurs talking with them is like go where the money is and like there's a ton of money in beer but like where's the go to people that have the money and it's not generally speaking like small brewery owners right. um so i don't know i don't know uh where i'll end up but it's nice to to at least check this off the list and like i i achieved a lot of things i wanted to achieve with tanglefoot so well, so that's one of the questions I always like to ask is like, if you were to do it all over, turn back the clock, knowing the workload, the way you, you know, knowing, not knowing then necessarily, I guess, knowing everything you know now, what you learned, what you experienced, who you've become, what you do it again? It would be, it, it would be dependent on my mindset. If I knew everything that I know now and my goals were the same as they are now, then no, like I, I wouldn't specifically open a brewery if my goal is to open a successful profitable business Mm -hmm. but if i knew everything that i know now and i was and i had to open a brewery i feel like i would at least have a better insight into what to do differently if i wanted to make it more successful relative to you know the 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 space that i was in so yeah i mean for those that i mean because a lot of people that are interested in opening breweries listen to this podcast so if you are interested in opening a brewery there's there's you know the checklist of things that will at least give you a better leg up and beer is not even in the top five. Like you have to make good beer nowadays. I think like you just make good beer is kind of like the standard. Don't make shitty beer. If you're making shitty beer in 2024, like that sucks. You should probably not be making beer, but you need to make good beer. That's a given, but you also need a good location that has other, that has a draw that is not specifically beer, probably serve wine, spirits, cider, all the beverages for people and just accept the the business model, which is a hospitality business model. And if you're interested in running a hospitality business model and you start from that perspective, I think you have a huge leg up because that, I mean, that really was like the biggest, um, 
that that was a huge like detrimental factor for me. It was like realizing that I was not in the business I thought I was in, which mm. most I think most people are probably in that in that camp. But like realizing I wasn't in the business I thought I was in, and the business I thought I was in was one I thought I already left. I thought <laughs> I, I thought I left. I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah, right. do that anymore. So um, if you accept that fact, you have a much better chance uh, right out of the gates. Because there, I mean, there there are examples of places that are have a great location, have have good beer, have good food, have good environment, have decent parking. You know, all the things that do decent. Like that, yeah. generally, like the brew pub model that sells a thousand barrels of beer right yeah, like that mediocre beer all five of the colors could, after the local landmark which like, is just, yeah but it works it works you. yeah it works so i mean yeah just just be aware of what business you're getting into and um yeah just d- don't um don't have delusions of grandeur don't think that you're going to be the next Deschutes who was on the the yeah. pod recently i mean he was very adamant that you're in the business of business not the business of beer yeah yeah but unfortunately, I don't think I've mentioned this on the show before, but there was a, I remember having the conversation with my wife where she's like, let's do a brewery, but I will never own a bar. And so then when Texas changed the law and we had to put in a tap room, she, she hated it. She yeah. was like, this is not what I wanted to do. I wanted to not, I literally said, I want to not do that. And I agreed. We plan to do that. And then the model changed. You had no choice. You had to do that. What year was that? I think it changed in 13, maybe. Well, well, yeah, but like, was that the year that your wife was like, yeah, this is not what I want to do? Yeah, so, well, so we opened in 2011. Well, we, we got licensed in 2011, opened in t- like January 2012. And from the beginning, she always said like, we'll do tours, we'll do like events, but I never want to own a bar. We're not going to have like a bar that's just open Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. So midnight or whatever. Yeah. And then it kept going. And then when the law changed, we like, doing everyone being basically to be competitive, you had to also have like a daily tasting or create that revenue. So she would try to have it open like four to six. Um, it just, you know, so it's like just a, just a moment of being open. It wasn't really a bar and that just wasn't realistic and it kind of grew. And so at one point she's like, I don't fucking like doing this anymore. So yeah, which I agree. Yeah. I mean, that's, that sucks when you're like trapped. you feel trapped? You're like, yeah, I have to do this thing. Like, cause from your perspective as a business owner, you're like the law changed and that's what everybody's doing. And there's more money. There's more profit margin. Like, be stupid not to like but i was going like, there you yeah gotta, you gotta take some of that money yeah yeah it is weird so when uh when's your next brewery opening well, it's gonna be a minute for okay. sure yeah yeah i actually had thought about even like would there be a chance that i would invest in like 10 percent to buy one that i thought was like just there's no reason to i'd yeah. rather just i enjoy now i love the experience of being on this side of the bar buying things i can spend yeah, yeah. 200 dollars on a bar tab and leave half the beer there. Yeah. I'm still making way more money than I would have as a brewery owner. So like I'm coming out way ahead. It's fun. I walk yeah. away. I'm like clocking out. <laughs> have you reached out to anybody that you, I mean, there's, there's definitely like players, especially in like the Austin area, but just generally in the beer scene that like people always point to is like, they're killing it. They're killing it. They're mm-hmm. killing it. Have you reached out to any of those breweries and been like, do, would you like to come share the story of how you're killing it in this industry? If you are, I, but that's part of why I interviewed Gary and yeah. I'm very, very specific. So I'm, I'm, I tread lightly on the idea of interviewing a quote unquote successful brewery yeah. because of the lie. And so three years ago, and you know, there's a propensity. No one tells you when they're doing shitty. You yeah. Know, yeah. We all need to do it. Everyone's doing shitty. Maybe three years ago, I put a thing out and I made a graphic board and I was like, all right, challenge the industry. Um, find me a, a, a profitable brewery, I, you, but you got to prove it and you will be my poster boy or girl. For the foreseeable future. Yeah. Free um, advertising. I, I want three years PL and I want three years balance sheet. And you have to be profitable all of those years. Cause if you know, how many times do you have a good, good year? Next year you have to reinvest and blah blah. And so ultimately you're losing money. And one two, that's not true. Five breweries reached out to me. Four were full of shit. Uh one of them was like a guy who was like, Well, I I'm profitable, but I don't pay myself. Then you're not about to profitable. You have you have free labor. Yeah. And so hey, let's play that whole thing to him. Um, which wasn't the point of the story, but interestingly, I forgot about this. He, I just saw that they're closing this weekend. Oh man, that guy, unfortunately, you know, but he thought he was profitable, and that sucks because he didn't understand. Yeah, but, man. But the one who was was Fiddlehead on the East Coast. He does like twenty five million a year. And he's killing. Oh it. wow! But it's scale. So in a wet sense, that sort of like proves you don't distro make money. Focus? Very high heavy distro, but a huge facility with a lot of events. But he sent me his numbers and he's legitimately profitable. Yeah. But at 25 million a year in sales. Like, yeah, it. I mean, that 
that's the thing is like, yeah, like we were saying, the scale of it. And there's definitely examples out there where like, I mean, I, I, I'm sure you've gone down Reddit, Reddit rabbit holes, but like there, there's a couple of like brewery forums um, and brewery uh, Reddit threads that are like, yeah, profitability and like startup costs and all this. And a couple of people on there, they're like, yeah, we do like 25 million or maybe it was like 12 to 20 million in tap rooms revenue across like two locations. And it's like, I mean, if it's all tap room, like I don't see how that couldn't be profitable. Like that model. Possible, but. Yeah, but like very unlikely. Like if you're doing 20 million in just retail tap room revenue, like, like I mean, Treehouse does insane amounts of revenue, yeah. but I, I assume I don't have their books, but. Um, That's the story I heard too. Yeah, but, but again, like, you know, that model where you're capturing all of that on site at retail prices. Yeah, of course, those numbers look great on paper, but often it's the, you know, you hope that that's the case, but it's usually like, oh, well, you sold 400 barrels this year, <laughs> as opposed to the 2000 you outlined yeah. in your in your business plan. So on food, it plays a big role in it. Like, And then when you get to that point too, you have this huge building, the hospitality piece that the staff is a bitch. Oh, dude, it sucks. Yeah, the restaurant side is is awful. That's the re- one of the reasons why I didn't, like there was just no, there was no, anytime you look at an industry and like it, the beer industry, we'll just use that as an example. The What is the best job for a brewer in this industry money-wise? Like what is the most amount of money you can make as a brewer? A hundred thousand, a hundred fifty thousand dollars at like Miller Coors or? I don't know if they pay that well, but if you've been there 30 years, maybe. Maybe, right? So like spend 30 years, work your way up. You are the, the I, and I could be speaking out. Maybe there's yeah. like some great paying jobs out well, there. Well, just EP of operations. Like, maybe, I mean, yeah. Right? But from a actual brewers, like the, what is the peak of the peak, the highest level, and just on the average like salary, like it's generally not that great. And so if, if you look at any industry and the peak salary for like the position that you're on track to, to work towards is not that great. Like there's there's a flaw in the model and that's mm-hmm. that there just isn't that much profitability. Like the restaurant industry, they're just not that profitable. <laughs> it's like it runs like razor thin margins. And so nobody in the industry like kills it unless you're an owner of like a, a high volume restaurant or a chain of restaurants. Like the individual people that work there just don't make that much money. And it's, I don't know. There's outliers, obviously. I, I'm I'm kind of speaking out of my ass, but I, I do think that if you look at the on average, like the, the amount of money that people make, and it, they're grossly underpaid to the median average. But that's part of the, In my opinion, that's a big part of the problem. In the industry is that the outliers are driving the conversation, and so everyone wants to talk about like we all X Y Z breweries doing well. And I mentioned this on the show before, but like when you go back and look at the numbers, I think it's seventy to eighty percent, depending on the year of the breweries make less than a thousand barrels a year. Yeah. So most of them are not making money, they're making beer. Yeah. And so um, the industry overall is sort of listening to these top 50 guys and what they're doing, yeah. but they're not even in the same fucking sport at that point. Yeah, you're <laughs> yeah, different business model yeah. totally. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, what do you think the direction is for the industry for those like smaller smaller players? Because like breweries will continue to open. They'll continue to close, but they'll continue to open. People will continue to open these passion projects. But what do you think will be the business model? You think they'll just keep opening like five and ten barrel breweries? And I think it the, the successful one is a seven barrel, four vessel brewed house, like somewhere in that, maybe even five. You can make so much beer with that. Um, I don't think you need more than that. There's a brewery outside of Houston. I think this month is opening with a thirty barrel brew house. I was like, guys, dude, I. Who the fuck told you that was going to work? Like, obviously, the one person was the guy who sold in the brew house. Yeah. Which sucks because it's just not fair. But, and, you know, more power to them. I hope that they're the exception that proves the rule. But the rule is that's not going to fucking work. It's like, we, and we know that. Yeah. That's a, yeah, I don't know. I, I keep, one of the things that I see is like a big um, inefficiency in the industry is the amount of capacity that's underutilized. So my brain always goes to like, the, I, I foresee a future where, there'll be a large amount of breweries that quote unquote open or maybe pivot to this where their product is just contract brewed and then they just own the tap room or they own the, mm-hmm. they own the the retail outlet for those brands. Like, honestly, that's the one business model that I 
considered like with, you know, if there was a Tanglefoot 2.0 is like have the beer brewed by somebody that has the capacity that could produce the product at the same level and just own the, the, the tapper, uh, just own the retail outlet because you don't have to worry about the manufacturing. You don't have to worry about the infrastructure that you have to put in the tanks, the floors, all that stuff. And you just capture the, the retail margin. But having said all that, you're just running the bar. <laughs> like at the end of the day, yeah. you're just running the bar. At a slightly lower margin. You can then, I think, distribute some of those products if you want. There's, yeah. And there is an advantage to not having to pay for it until it's done. So if you, if there's that, that middle model where you own a tank and you can go in and you brew on it and you take all your stuff. But the other side is like, if you just pay like a per case fee and when it's done and delivered to you, it's ready to go, you can sell it the next day. Sure. You can yeah. monetize that quicker too instead of having to order grains and float that supply. That might be better. Um, when you met, asked what, what if I would ever do a brewery again, I ran that model down in my head of like, would I produce pickle fucker that way? Because mm-hmm. there was a legitimate market for that beer, and I I just went back to like, it's not enough. Like I just I don't I don't, I don't want to fight the fight. Not worth uh My life is much happier now. Why would I go backwards? Yeah, that's, that's fair. Know. It's just that it's that hook is in you. You know, it's mm-hmm. always pulling back. And when it was fun, there's so many memories I had that were great. That I mean, I just really enjoyed it. And I'm sure you did too. Like hanging out with people, going to events. Um, you got to go behind the scenes, obviously, as a, brewer, a head brewer at Blackstar, I'm sure. But only a brewery, it's a different thing. It's, it's a different kind yeah. of, it's a different camaraderie, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it is a weird. It's a it's a weird feeling because my I actually was talking with another brewery owner recently, and as I'm kind of like pivoting out of the, not necessarily like pivoting out of the beer industry, but like I closed my brewery and am no longer working as a person that makes beer my identity for the last, you know, 12, 13 years has been beer. Mm. And so then I'm a pretty, you know, I'm a pretty confident person in general. And like, I'm happy to like change and pivot. like, I'll do something else. I don't care. I'll go learn, learn another skill or do something. But like, I do see that like, it's, that it is a tough pill to swallow when like your whole identity was like, I make beer and this thing was cool. Like this was the thing that was like, the reason I got into it is that it was a cool thing to do. And now that it is less cool because it's not as, I mean, it's so ubiquitous and it's not as unique as it once was, but it's less cool. And now you're kind of reeling with, what do you do? Like, what do you want to do? Is there something else that's cool? Or do you want to, is there another trend that you want to jump onto and do that? Or just kind of swallow that bitter pill and go get a, a real job. Well, I will say that, uh, you, you burned the candle probably at both ends more than I did, but I did it a lot as well. And when I took that workload and like that expectation of like what a day felt like, and I laid it over like a regular job, yep. I became number one in sales and overnight. That's, so, that's what where we do I'm, next. Honestly, great. that's where my brain is. I'm like, if you, I said this a lot, honestly, shout out to Black Star Co-op. If anybody's in the Austin area, go there. They're great. But um, Black Star is such a weird place to have cut my teeth at because I worked with some of the, like the smartest and coolest people that I had ever met. I mean, granted, I was like an impressionable like twenty year old, but yeah. like just some super intelligent people in that place. You know, Black Stars had struggles for for years, and just like it's a restaurant, it's a brew pub, it's hard to to make that work. And I just think like if if we all put our efforts into whatever in twenty twelve into a social media marketing agency, like we. It, it would have company. crushed, or, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But like, just if you, we had put our efforts into something that was more, had more leverage or more uh, potential for profitability. It just like, you would, you would have learned a whole different, uh, you know, slew of lessons. Like, oh, this is what, when you learn a lot more about business, when you have that margin to work with and make mistakes and do things versus like, we are just constantly running scared. Yeah, yeah this can afford the mistakes. Yeah, you can afford yeah. the mistakes. You, like here, I'm... I make a mistake and that's it. Just done. Yeah. Well, I tell people we, we sold our first company to, to gyms for you know millions of dollars and we ended up putting a lot of it back in the brewing industry and losing it and then losing a little bit more. Um, and at the, I did the math. If, if I had just bought commercial real estate, I would have been retired by now. Yeah. But I also would have been an asshole. So at the end of the day, owning a brewery yeah. changed who I was, changed my life, changed my perspective. In a good way. Yeah. It's not an investment I would have made willingly. I'd just yeah. say, for 800 grand, I'll let you yeah. <laughs> become a better guy. But I don't know, like, everything, the path is the path, right? But you can't. Yeah. No, I, no regrets. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy with the whole, the whole trajectory. It's just interesting. You know, you grow up in this industry and then you change and so now you want something different in life. And, and 
you know, maybe a healthier lifestyle that isn't completely focused around drinking alcohol and, yeah. um, which is a big thing in the industry. Um, so yeah, I don't know. A lot of stuff there. Dan, well, let's wrap it up. I want to end with the question I love to ask everybody. We talked around it a lot, but what is, what do you, what is the legacy? Like regardless of whether Tanglefoot moves on as a, a beer brand in the future, what is, what do you want the legacy of Tanglefoot to have been? Um, I mean, honestly, I want to have, I want to have at least better people say like the industry, like I, w- I hope that I bettered the industry in some way, but I hope I like better the, the beer drinking culture in Texas. Like I hope to have promoted this particular style of beer. I hope to have educated people. Like the point of the, the YouTube channel was to like educate people on things mm-hmm. kind of the backside of the industry or maybe even just like technical beer knowledge. But I hope to have educated people and continue to educate people and share my path. The things that, I, that really drew me into beer with other people because I, I had a pretty unique beer experience and, and kind of got lucky right place, right time and got blast thrust into the beer industry when I was 22 years old and, you know, took over a brewery three years later. And so I got all this experience and, and, um, and exposure to, to the great things in this industry. And I hope that I have done something to at least like interest people in beer, uh, to, I don't, I don't think that the goal was to ever like sway people from drinking like light beer. Cause I love light beer. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, everything has its place, but at least like show people that there are beers that are just as balanced and easy drink, like easily drinkable that are available out there that aren't just like, you know, the big macro beers. Yeah. I think that's, you know, I think that's always a goal of, of craft beers. Like, you know, show people that there's a little something different out there. Yeah, well, I will say that uh, I don't speak for the overall industry, but for me personally, my experience with uh, Texas craft beer and the United States craft beer overall, um, it's rare, especially since I sold my brewery. It has been very rare that I've tasted a beer and smiled. I did with yours, so I appreciate that you did that for me. And Thanks, man. We're able to do great, great beer. I'm sure wherever you go next is going to be fantastic, and uh, I'll keep an eye out for you. But I really appreciate you sharing the story and being part of the podcast and being part of the education. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I will link your YouTube and all your stuff on there. And- uh, if, you, if you end up wanting to give contact information for being a consultant, I don't do it. I'm happy to send someone somewhere else. So <laughs> yeah. I'll definitely do that. So heard that. Well, thanks, man. Appreciate you having me on. No problem. Let's uh, let's wrap up, and then I got one more beer left. Go drink. So, nice. Thanks.